There are probably some things here in the talk that will help with that discussion. Um, my disclosures. And first, uh, the team doing this research is really Louis Pitacek at Inghui Fu, who've been doing it for the longest time. And Liza and I joined the group, I don't know, about eight years ago. And, and, and so I'm speaking on behalf of the team. It's not my work. Um, and the, I'm just going to talk about how much the question of how much sleep we need in a very big picture sense, I'm repeating some of the things that came up earlier in Marisa's talk, at least referring to it, and then talk about these people who are familial natural short sleepers and what the genetics and mechanisms of that are, the hints we have so far, and some evidence that there may be a link of natural short sleep with the concept, vague as it is, of resilience. So first, um, I want to refer to something Maurice referred to, that uh, we have societies in our, in our field of sleep who make recommendations about how much people should be sleeping. And people hear it, and they, it's it, it part of our culture. That, and it was probably there already based on just observations and, 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 and society passing along knowledge. But you know, if, you, if you look at this, um, there is a, uh, a, you know, a, a very clear prescription for certain amounts of sleep. And, you know, it's, it's recommended, let's say, for all adults between 18 and 65 to get seven to nine hours of sleep. And it may be appropriate to get six to seven hours of sleep, but it's not recommended to get less. And, um, and I, I was, uh, this is one evidence that this is out in the culture as I was watching some television series show. I just yeah. came to walk in and my wife was watching some series about the White House and politicians. And the president was in the bathtub having a conversation with his wife. And, and um, he said, look, I got to get to bed earlier because the National Sleep Foundation says that I need seven hours of sleep a night and I'm only getting like between five and six. And so something terrible is going to happen to my health. So, so it's in the culture. Um, so here's, I'm not, this is a very similar figure to what Maurice showed, the, the bell shaped curve of sleep desperation. And I'm interested here in the people between zero hours and, and, and six, maybe six and a half hours that uh that show up here it's not a small percentage of people i mean if you if you look at that adding up all of those co columns uh it's a fair amount of people so the question is who are those people um you know there's about there's more than 10 percent of them if, if you take all of those columns together then they're sleeping six hours or less and you know those studies that j led to that kind of picture don't unlike Maurice, they don't like assess are they healthy, are they not healthy, and uh, what are what is the context for it? And Maurice gave us a little hint about that. There certainly is a contribution of illness, uh, psychiatric and medical illness. But so some of, and some of these people may be people with sleep disorders, um, and and I think some are people who who are not reading the recommendations and and sleep depriving themselves or don't take it to heart, um, but. Uh, but I do believe that this is a, a problem in some ways. If there are people who actually need less than six hours of sleep, uh, you know, I've, de I've dealt with people in um, who have this uh, trait that I'm going to talk about I, well, well before I started working on this project. The first time happened, and I think it was... Um, about 30 years ago in a sleep clinic, I was you know, seeing patients of all types and somebody came in and said, I'm here because I, everybody says I'm supposed to get a bunch of you know, more sleep than I do. And, and I'm only sleeping five hours a night. And, and, I, and I said, well, you know, are you having impairment during the day? Are you, is, there any, is there any deficit you're experiencing? Is there any function or problem or do you have any complaints? No. And, and, and I said, well, you, are, you, explain to me again why you're here. And he said, well, two things, really. I'm worried that something bad's going to happen from what I hear. And the other is I'm bored because I have all this extra time on my hands. And I saw 
about two or three people like that, but very few since the internet became widely uh, accessible in people's homes and cable TV. This happened more before cable TV and internet, I think, uh, that people were bored, but, but that, that's gone away. And um, so that kind of person is getting worried out there because they think they're supposed to be doing something that they're not and they don't understand you know, uh, what, what, what they are, what's going on with them. So um, are there short sleepers, people who need less sleep than everyone else? I think a fundamental problem we have is that we actually don't have a way to tell how much sleep any individual needs any better than asking, well, how much sleep do you need to feel good and function good during the day? That's what we do clinically. Um, and that's all we have. It, there's not a test. There's a lot of people working on this. So nobody can tell another person actually how much sleep they need. I'm hoping in the next 10 years, there'll be a proteomic solution or some kind of test where I'll be able to get people and say, look, you're sleeping five, but you really need seven or you're sleeping 11, but you really need three, whatever it is. Um, you know, all of this stuff, the links to glucose tolerance, type two diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, mortality, uh, are, 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 are associations. And, um, you know, and, and, and the rec again, the, these are all things that people hear about and they're supposed to, that they should be sleeping more uh, because otherwise they're going to get all of these things and that makes them afraid, especially these people who are short sleepers face that discrepancy. Um, so, the, but I think that the, the, there's a lot of evidence that the amount of sleep people need to feel rested and function well or function well on specific tasks varies quite a bit. There's forever, we've had sleep deprivation experience in, experiments. And if you talk to anyone who does sleep deprivation experiments, they tell you that there are these consequences that you see cognitive impairment, metabolism, endocrine function problems, um, et cetera, cardiovascular problems, but they cause acutely cognitive problems. And uh, um, most commonly, or, or feeling bad sleepy during the day. And they, they find that there are, is a lot of variability in the population. People like David Dinges, a colleague that many of you know and, and have worked with, um, just he, it's obvious when he does his studies, which he does a lot of, he finds great variation in the degree to which people are impacted by having their sleep deprived and also the, the number of hours at which that occurs. So, um, so I think that, you know, and, and I, this is known in our culture also, like the military, uh, part of their like selection of the elite, uh, Teams like the Navy SEALs includes the, 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 their capacity to tolerate sleep deprivation because they get sent on these missions and they get, you know, they have to be awake for, you know, 52 hours and something, whatever, to do whatever they have to do. So it, we, we see this in the culture. Um, it, you know, but one interesting point that if you start looking at the people who have limited sleep is that there appears to be a genetic component. There's a lot of observations about this. Just the amount of EEG delta power, um, is, is, which is a marker of homeostatic sleep pressure. That is, if you sleep deprive a person, you get a rebound of an elevate of delta power the night of recovery. And, uh, and the longer a person's awake, the greater that is. And there's evidence that delta power, and it's how vulnerable you are to, or how, how much that builds up when you cut sleep is varies among uh, mice species. You can breed it into mice species, the capacity to have more or less of that. Uh, we also see it to agree in, in, in humans. And there's twin studies that show that sleep length is heritable. There's also GWAS studies that suggest that 10 to 21% of sleep duration is heritable. Um, and they made some links to clock genes. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, and then there's some point, some hints about from these GWAS studies about about uh, some associations that are present. Um, but I'm going to talk about genetics at a different level. And this was started by Ing Hui Fu primarily, who's just a brilliant geneticist. And it started with Chris Jones when uh, Ing Hui and Louis were at um, Ing Hui and Louis are 
were, have worked together for many, many years. So the, the, Chris Jones was a neurologist at U, University of Utah where they were, and he said, look, I found this patient and he has a fa whole family or at least another family member. I think it was just one other family member who would sleep sh a short period of time and, and they do also. And so they start, oh, let's look at the genetics. They were, Louis and Inway were already doing genetics of neurologic conditions. And so they did a candidate gene uh, sequencing from the families and, and, um, and found, and they were actually looking at people with early wake time. And they were first, the first thing they found was it's an advanced sleep phase genetics. But in the process of doing that, they found the, the short sleep uh, as well. And they had identified uh, a point mutation in this uh, gene for a protein called DEC2, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit. Um, in a family, there were two people affected, but you know, of, 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 uh, it looked like an inheritance pattern. I'll show you that. Um, and they reported a lifelong shorter daily sleep uh, than, their, than their family members who, who weren't le short sleeping less. Um, and they were healthy and happy. And um, so uh, the, the idea there was having found that DEC2 gene, it was hard to know whether to believe it since it was only two people and it was a candidate gene search. And so, um, so they developed mice with, the, with this mutation and found that those mice um, are also short sleep less than their unaffected uh, wild type uh, mates. And um, basically, the, the, they have more time awake and less time in sleep. So um, first, the, the family, this is, there were just two people, and they slept uh, on average to their report. This is reported sleep, six hours and six and a half minutes. They also had activity uh, to, to, to back this up, uh, movement sensor to pick data. They didn't have polysomnography, which is the standard sequence. So these people had later uh, sleep onset uh, times. They're about the same, but they got up earlier primarily. But they had less total sleep. And um, sort of, they were cross-generational. And that said, huh, that, you know, that's what led to, maybe we should check on the genetics of this. And um, so this is the mice here. And there's a lot of stuff, and I don't want you to get bogged down in but. If you look at the uh, B and C, they just show you that um, that the percent wakefulness throughout the light period and dark period, and remember mice sleep in the light period, but mice normally, have, unlike humans, they, they nap more, like they have more sleep periods during the day. But you can see that the, the percent wakefulness is greater in the deck two uh, animals, uh, both during the light period and the dark period, um, but but it, it was primarily a light period effect. You see that, that it's bigger and the statistical significance is really there primarily for the light period. And then if you look at the percent non-REM REM sleep per hour, um, there's really a difference in non-REM uh, during their light period and a little bit during the dark period, but not so much in REM except during the light period. So I, I guess the non-REM difference is also bigger in the light period. As you can see statistically here, all the comparisons just occur in the light period. So these people are sleeping less, these people, these mice are sleeping less during the period that they normally sleep. They're more awake in, with this mutation. This is important because I'm gonna show you another mutation where that's not the case. It's a different pattern, that there's different, different ways that this gets manifest among um, an animal. So what is DEC2 and what is it doing? So it turns out that um, th there was some evidence that the, the neurotransmitter, the peptide hypocretinorexin, which we know has a regu regulated sleep, uh, it is particularly, you know, it's now been linked to narcolepsy, the loss of those neurons in humans and in animals. And, you know, that, uh, hypocretinorexin, two names given to the same thing because the two groups couldn't agree. The Stanford group, uh, gave it the name hypocretin and the UT Southwestern group who both discovered this thing at the same time gave it a rexin and so it's got two names. Um, but let's just use a rexin because most of the world tends to use that one. Um, the, 
the erection gene, uh, so, so erection is formed by a pre pro form where there's two pieces, and there, and it's because there's actually two types of erections, A and B, one and two, whatever, but there's two different parts. And there's a protein that's cleaved to form the functional form of this protein, of these two proteins. And the DEC2 suppresses the expression of that precursor, the preproerection that has both pieces before it's cleaved. And so there's just less of it. And then and the DEC2 doesn't work in the in in the in the mutant. It's a what we call a loss of I don't call so people call a loss of function mutation so that the DEC2 gene doesn't work so well and they make more orexin hypocretin and which we know is wake promoting, right? The nar narcoleptics fall asleep. They're not, they're sleepier people, at least during the day. Um, and and um, although they have disturbed sleep at night, but proof, you know, sort of for this, this is, this is actually my idea because I do have done work with, with um, the, with these drugs that block erection receptors, it, it was to say, see if they could block it by giving the animals erection antagonists, and they could. It blocked the effect. So this DEC2 is a protein that is mediating the effect. But there's a really fascinating point about this, I think. My assumption was, was that natural, maybe other people's assumption, is that natural short sleepers are naturally short sleep. People, they need less sleep because they're super sleepers. Their sleep is better than everybody else's. It's got some great component to it. But this suggests that they're super wakers, at least this deck two mutant, because erection keeps you awake more, they've got more of it, and it, you know, it's not, you can't, by having extra erection, sleep more, it, or have super sleep, unless having more effective erection release during the, the, the daytime, makes your sleep better. That, that's somehow part of the regulatory mechanism of, how, of, of what makes sleep effective is some kind of balance with waking and the nature of what happens when you're awake. I'm going to come back to this point of super waking. Um, one verification of this is after that work was done, uh, uh, there was a mutation in a pair of dizygotic twins who had the same BMI pretty much similar, a number of similarities. And the one with the mutation had less sleep, didn't need as much sleep after sleep deprivation, uh, did better after sleep deprivation in terms of cognition than their unaffected sibling. Suggesting it was a de novo mutation, didn't run. Away. So some va validation that this DEC2 mutation really does mediate a short sleep need in humans. So here's another family, more convincing than the DEC2 family. After that happened, Louis and, and Ingwe went on a search for families like this, and, and they just got, when that paper was published, they got some people contacting them and said, oh, you know, hang on like that. And then they, the, our group has collected a number, uh, now a fair number of these. And so here's a, a family that um, has, as you could, the, the full, Filled in squares, either black or white, are where it's known, um, uh, or there, and the black squares are or circles are affected, and the white squares or circles are unaffected, and you see a pattern here, which looks like an autosomal dominant pattern. That is, if a, one parent has it, half of the siblings have it, roughly, and have their children, half of their their offspring. That's classic autosomal dominance. And that actually fits with what was observed in the mice with the DEC2 gene. It was, it's an autosomal dominant, highly penetrant gene. Um, and, it, it, and, and so there's something like that going on with this family. And having done the genetics with their, all the blood on these people, it turned out that there was a mutation in the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, a receptor we talked about a lot in medicine because it's related to blood pressure and Blood pressure drugs bind to this and, and things like that, and pulse rate, and it's a, it regulates pulse, and autonomic nervous system function in general. And the people with the mutation have it, and the people, I mean, people with the trait have this gene, and those without the trait do not. So here's a picture of these people. And so we have two, 
seven of the people who who um, uh, have the mutation and uh, five unaffected family members. And you can see that the, there's a difference in sleep time, 5.7 uh, versus 7.9. But I want to draw your attention to one unique individual here. And this is the second person who has the gene, but only had, but is sleeping seven and a half hours. Now, if this is truly autosomal dominant, a highly penetrant gene, that shouldn't happen. Well, genet I learned, I had no knowledge of this, from geneticists that, no, this is very common because the background that that gene sits in matters. So there might be something about that person's physiology that renders that mutation un irrelevant or that counters it. But this is just evidence that that is true and, and in this case, and that there is somebody who sleeping seven and a half hours. Like they may have two mutations. They may have like a long sleep and a short sleep, or they might you know, have something in the pathway related to a rectum that, or the DAC2 or something. So, um, but very interesting from my point of view. So the, the beauty of having the capacity to express the gene in the mice and, and, and recapitulate or not, the sleep problem also means you can study mechanisms. That's how the DEC2 mechanism related to orexin was able to be developed because the mice have the mutation. So the mice are also show that they're, in this case, that they're, they're short sleepers. And in this case, they're more, they're elevated in activity, in the, both during the light and dark phase. So interestingly, two different mutations with two different physiologic effects have the same final common pathway of short sleep. Um, so they, uh, so it was a, a, they had fewer sleep bouts um, in, in, rather than um, than uh, shorter just amount of sleep totally. It was like the same length of sleep bouts. They just had fewer of them. The other interesting thing here is unlike the deck two mice, these mice have a difference in their delta power during their sleep. Their their slow wave sleep is different. They have significantly higher at the beginning of the night and it decreases more rapidly. That looks like super sleep or, or compensatory sleep. Like it's like what you see if you sleep deprive, deprive an animal or a human that doesn't have a mutation. And so um, the, 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 um, there are clear differences among these mutations. And one of the goals of our team is to try to understand how these different mutations with different physiology lead to a final common pathway that's the same. So this just shows you the data here, and you can see statistically significant differences uh, on their total uh, mobile time, that's wake time, in the light phase and the dark phase. Um, but but the, the dark phase is actually, um, the effects are a bit bigger. So this is during the time that they're normally wake. And, um, the uh, let's see, I forgot. I can't remember what's different. I think the bottom, um, the bottom D, E, and F what occurred during exposure to light or, or extra it changed uh, light exposure, something like that. That, um, but it's the the regular data. Um, oh no, excuse me. The top one is the time awake and the bottom, we did the experiment with it, we're exposed to light all the time to look at things. And that did show some, some, some other stuff. But here it's just showing that the, the bigger difference is in wake time rather than sleep time. And um, that they're, they're mobile for more time. And that, that is mainly showing up during their period when they're normally awake. They're sleeping more when they're normally awake. Uh, but they're wake more primarily in their sleep state, but but in both, but in both. And then you can see the delta power over the night here, which is elevated um, at the beginning of the night in the mutants. So intriguing. Um, so what is it? What is it doing? Why? What is it? Beta, beta and one adrenergic receptor doing? So I thought it's going to be this some kind of really broad effect because there are beta one adrenergic receptors all over the place. Well, it, curiously, and for reasons I don't understand at all, 
It's a very local effect. You can block this effect by an intervention that you do in one part of the brain only. It's in the, the pond. So um, the, oops, sorry, uh, th that this, um, it's in the dorsal pond. And there's so these neurons that, um, both a mix of glutamate and GABAergic neurons in the dorsal pond that tend to, um, tend to promote sleep. And they, so they, they are, um, uh, the, the, um, yeah, uh, oh, excuse me, I got it backwards. The neurons um, tend to lead to uh, waking, sorry. And, the, and this pathway uh, regulates those neurons. And by when you, um, and, and um, but it, oh, sorry, that's right. But it inhibits, uh, it, it normally, excuse me, it normally, um, uh, yeah, inhibits the dorsal ponte neurons, but which leads to actually an increase in transition from non-REM to wake in those neurons. Which uh, so this this gene um, is in a pathway that actually ultimately uh, stimulates them to to a a, uh, a greater degree um, in in act in and 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 leads to more transitions from uh, non REM to wake and 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 uh, in general keeps the animals awake more and. I just want to point to two other things that are relatively, uh, or a couple of other things that are relatively less well developed. One, there are two different families who have a mutation in the type one metabotropic glutamate receptors. This is one type of glutamate receptor called G GMR or GRM1. And two different families had a mutation in this in different places. And both of them had affected family members uh, who had short sleep and unaffected family members who didn't. So these are very rare mutations. And the um, and you can see here one of the families. There's just one generation of data, and the, and half of the siblings ha are affected, which looks a lot like what you would expect in an autosomal dominant if the one of the parents had it. But the parents are unfortunately uh, deceased and. Or at least one of them who's expect who's who thought to be the carrier, and then the other family is one parent, one child. So, uh, and you can see that the total sleep time difference is profound in this group, and I'll get back to them in a minute. But um, they ultimately the mice who have the GRM1 um, had uh, less sleep time for the mutant mice of both types, both. GRM mutations, but it was, the change was only seen in non-REM, but not REM. And uh, they, they both, and the, and the mutants tended to sleep um, less during the dark phase when, when, uh, when wake, wakefulness normally happens. Um, no difference in delta power at all. And, uh, and unlike the other mice, that showed resilience to sleep deprivation, these animals uh, are, are affected by sleep deprivation. No different than the wild type. This is important, keep that in mind because I'm gonna come back to it. But the point is we have three different genes, all of which cause natural short sleep with three different physiology, three different me me mechanism physiology, and we don't know what they have in common. Um, and they're both loss of receptor function, but it's not clear. If one, um, they're lo me, yeah, lo loss of a, a function in the GRM1 receptor, but it's not clear how that leads to uh, uh, effect at this point. And then I just want to point out that there's two people who are single. We only have one person uh, who, ha who, who has a short sleep. We don't have a a clear uh, familial pattern in them, but they were explored anyway for a gene that, that might be linked. And it turned out that 
a mutation of the neuropeptide S receptor and the HOMER1 gene, which is an enzyme that, that, that uh, is a postsynaptic uh, scaffolding protein that, that um, is on, I think it's on glutamate neuron uh, primarily. But they, um, one individual in, 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 in the family has it, and, and the mice show a short sleep phenotype. But um, so it, there's reason to think they might be short sleep genes, but there's not enough human data to be confident. And there's not, not really yet any understanding of the mechanism. So um, I want to tell you about our experience. This was my one of the, I, I joined the project and was a human phenotyper. And then also I wanted to bring people into the lab and study their sleep in the sleep lab because the data that, that, that the team had before that was all actigra actigraphy and self-report. So we didn't really know about sleep physiology and there, you know, there wasn't a rigorous test of, of how they actually sleep at night uh, because actigraphy has, has limitations, it's a movement sensor, it's not a sleep sensor. Um, so we did this rigorous protocol and um, I put a huge amount of resources into pulling together a team to do this. And um, I'm gonna preempt a problem you'll see in the data, which is that we had to stop after a little while because of COVID, it hit right while I was getting rolling with this. And I'm, then we haven't picked it up after COVID because we've gotten so picky about designing the study that we, we haven't implemented it yet. So, um, but we have all, you know, all these bells and whistles added because we got to look at this data and that as a basis for making a redesign. So we brought these people in and we got uh, some GRM, all the GRM, one affected family people in one of the families. And then we had two other people, one who has a, a FNSS um, pattern, but there's no gene associated. And the other one who's a healthy, uh, um, and the other one who is a uh, Homer one mutation. And the one Homer one mutation we have. So, this is what we did, but basically we had them come into the sleep lab, sleep there for a couple of nights, and then we sleep deprived them because number of, some of these mutant patients were saying that they don't get affected by sleep deprivation so much. They can go without a sleep, night of sleep, and it doesn't really affect them. It doesn't really matter, but they do a little bit better maybe if they sleep. And um, and then uh, the... the uh, and others said that they do get affected by sleep deprivation. That that was the, the and the mice, the GRM, this family that I'm going to tell you about, were affected, say they are affected by sleep deprivation, and the mice were also, interestingly. So we wanted to look at that, and then we gave them recovery sleep, and we looked at their cognition, and we got blood samples, and um, and and we, which we have, by the way, somewhere stored. Um, I have not done, haven't done anything yet. Um, so it was a complicated paradigm, but just here's who here's what they look like in some basics about their about their sleep. So you have the three uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor people on three top lines. Uh, the one person who has the trait but doesn't have a gene on the bottom line and may or may not actually have it. I mean in the in the in the penultimate line, and then we have um, excuse me here. Um, and then the, the bottom line is the one Homer one person. So we have two nights in the sleep lab um, and the, the, the accommodation night and the baseline night. And th this is going to compare, we're comparing to actigraphy here because <coughs> to give a hint about how accurate that data was that Louis and, and, and Ingwei had gathered before I had joined the team. And so you can see that, that the first person um, slept in the lab polysomnography 4.41 hours and 4.78 hours. And then uh, they, th then the, the second person 3.98 hours and 6.61 hours. The third person 5.98, 5.98. The first fourth person four and 5.1. And then the last person 3.78 and 2.81. And then after that we a night of total sleep deprivation, they got a chance to sleep. And remarkably, the sleep is not much different um, but they got a chance to nap after the night of sleep deprivation during the day. So I don't know how much that affected things here. It confounds our, that recovery sleep number. And I'll 
show you some data in a second about this. But um, but I think one thing that was assure, reassuring is that the actigraphy is is pretty close in picking up their sleep. It's not it's not it, it's you know who knows we just had two nights here and the actigraphy had many nights so um, so it might actually be correct or exactly correct but I doubt it I'm sure it's close so the other thing was here we gave the people the standard one of the standard tests we do for sleepiness which is a maintenance of wakefulness test where we bring people into the lab and we have them give them four nap opportunities and we say okay um, you know lie in the room and you can't do anything. And, um, and the lights are off, and you have to try to stay awake as best you can. And it's shown to be pretty sensitive for sleep deprivation. More often clinically, we use the, what's called the, uh, the, um, the multiple sleep latency test, which is where uh, you know, people are put in the room, but they're told to, tr to try to go to sleep, and, um, or, or nothing, but they're not told to try to stay awake. And um, that's just a slight variant that's done clinically. This turns out to be more sensitive to treatment effects, which is why it is used in research studies. Um, but the, so you can see four naps, the blue is after the first two nights in the lab, there's no sleep deprivation. So you see the first person had 4.6 hours of sleep and then had no sleep at all in four naps in a row. That's not a sleepy person. A sleepy person would fall asleep in, you get like 40 minutes to fall asleep, 30, something like 30 or 40 minutes. They didn't fall asleep at all. Um, the next the next person didn't either. The third person slept uh, 5.98 hours and, and did fall asleep on the first nap only, but none of the others. And then remarkably, the last one, who was the shortest sleeper, only fell asleep once and, and after 19 minutes. So to me, this is verification that these people get this short amount of sleep. It's only two nights. I'd love to have like, 100 nights, but it's better than nothing. And they're not sleepy. But if you sleep deprive them, all of them responded with a compensatory sleepiness. Every one of them. So these, this, but this was the, the first three do have the, the phenotype, uh, the genotype that the mice had who also had uh, continued vulnerability to sleep deprivation, just like the wild type mice. What we don't have is any data yet on any human who have sleep uh, phenotypes from the genes where there seem to be resilience to sleep deprivation. So I'm looking forward to studying those people. Stay tuned. Um, but, but a remarkable kind of finding is that we have people clearly who need less sleep in terms of sleepiness, and then, but they do get affected by sleep deprivation. Now, here's an interesting um, a observation here, we did cognitive testing on these people. And um, the baseline cognitive testing is where it says 20. Uh, at the very left, the time and hours, the first 20, before the first column of gray. The first column of gray is the night of sleep deprivation. The next day is, and, and it, there's like 40, like, what are they? They're awake for almost 30 hours or something. Bands, and then you see a dotted, another dotted gray column there, bar. That's when they got their nap. And then you can see a little bit later their night sleep of recovery. So this is a psychomotor vigilance test. Uh, David didn't just use this as a test, a sensitive test of cognition uh, that, as to de that detects sleep deprivation very sensitively. Um, it's, it's basically a simple reaction time. And um, we looked at all the parameters that David looks at. David is actually a consultant on this project, and he helped us design our cognitive battery. And um, you can see here that all of the people remain flat. They don't get longer in their, their reaction time doesn't get slower. They don't get longer over the course of 30 hours of sleep deprivation. I mean, excuse me, not 30 hours of sleep deprivation. Um, yeah, I mean, in this case, yes, 30 hours of sleep deprivation. Remember also the baseline measure is after their normal short sleep. Sorry. So that after sleep deprivation, they don't seem to get worse and worse. And just the, there's this one outlier there who actually does get worse. That's the person where we don't have a gene. So they may actually not be a true short sleeper. I, we don't know, but they certainly have some traits of it. But if you look at the others, there's no evidence that they're 
their reaction time is getting worse over like the time of af oh, they're awake after sleep deprivation. It's supposed to, you know, that's but in what we see in every study with humans, and it doesn't. Um, and it doesn't recover after the recovery of sleep because it, you know, it, it goes right back to where it was essentially the whole time. So I can't go into the detail of all the cognitive responses, but we didn't. The controls that we had lined up to study were um, uh, were were prevented by COVID, so we don't we didn't get any, which is sad. But um, but we do have population norms for all of the cognitions that we cog cognitive tests that we performed that David made available to us. But they're for a population of older of younger people. Our people were old relatively. Just to, to point it out here. Um, 71, 69, 64, 69, 77. So if anything, they would be expected to be cognitively impaired, right? Uh, not necessarily. It, impairment in cognition is not an inevitable consequence of aging. Um, it is a, uh, we know that if there's impairment, there's a reason of some kind, a neurodegenerative condition, something. So here, um, these people have a smaller effect compared to uh, the, the general population than uh, a, a healthy control sample of of people that um, that are significantly younger. I don't think the mean age of this group is like thirty or forty. And I I'm not going to go. Why does it say effect size? Don't worry about it. that. The number in the in the right column is lower means that their cognition is better, and they're better or the same on every measure. Um, at baseline and after a night of sleep deprivation. So while these people get sleepy with sleep deprivation, their cognition wasn't affected remarkably. Um, so um, th this just showing you, that, uh, oh yeah, the control group that we used um, had a, uh, had a, um, excuse me. Now I, I also looked at the overnight sleep stage data in these people and their delta power over the night and um i they're a small number how, how would we assess whether they have their normal or not um so i had a cohort of 30 healthy controls and 30 insomnia patients i compared them to and we didn't find any differences in sleep stage percentage or delta power at all compared to those populations and that um is consistent with the mice data because these these animals did not have an elevation in delta power over the night, unlike the other ones. So just some general observations I'm gonna move towards wrapping up here. Um, people with natural short sleep are people who it's defined by, it was defined with essentially by Ing Huey and, and Chris Jones as people who sleep four to six, 6.6 6 hours per night. Um, and that's actually what we actually had, but it's six and a half, or less without any impairment or co problems or of any kind. These people don't report any sleepiness or reported deficits um, from sleep deprivation, except for the GRM1 people did report sleepiness during the day, and in fact, they had it. Um, there are people out there called facultative short sleepers uh, who are people who can like stay up one night uh, and do fine cramming for an exam or something like that, but they don't have night to night short sleep. Uh, these people catch up on weekends and things like that. And um, one question everybody asks when, when I talk about this, particularly in psychiatry uh, heavy top audiences, is that you would think maybe these people have bipolar disorder. So we heard earlier today about the sleep of bipolar disorder, and those people need less sleep than everyone else when they're manic. Are these people just manic or hypomanic? Well, I don't know. But I can tell you, they don't have any symptoms of mania or hypomania other than the decreased sleep needs. So it could be a variant where they, and it's always present, it doesn't come and go in episodically. So it doesn't look like bipolar, but maybe it's some kind of variant. Um, the other point is that there's, if, if, um, if you talk to these people, which I did at length, it's striking that there are some differences among them um, 
And one of those differences is that they tend to be extremely uh, effective, active individuals. Their days are different than everybody else's. They're, these people are energetic and they want to go, get up and go. And, and they, it's not like they have like maladaptive energy or anything like that or in, impulsivity. They, but they're just really go-getter people who um, seem to have like more waking, more effective waking, whatever that means. And that's sort of consistent with the um, the DEC2 and ADRB1 kinds of mutations, um, which are enhancing, probably enhancing daytime. They're working at, at least to some degree on that. Um, and so we wanted to quantify this trait and a behavioral drive, and it was very difficult to do that. Uh, we couldn't find a good test, and we're thinking about creating a scale, but that's a very difficult, long, say it in thing, a long a project that takes a long time. But um, these people tend to be mentally active. They tend to have multiple jobs or high pressure jobs. Um, and but remarkably, we saw it, we started to detect this pattern in that they reported they're less affected by bad things happening when they have a loss or difficulty, they tend to handle it better. So we thought to um, to measure resilience in them. And resilience is formally defined as basically the degree to which somebody is able to function despite loss or adversity. Turns out it's correlated with depression risk. And, and um, we don't really have paradigms for it. We don't really have that much information about it. Um, the importance to me in it was the possibility that it could be a predisposing factor for depression or, or a precursor for depression. And then, then we have an interesting toehold into studying the mechanisms of emergence of depression because we have mice who have this trait. And remarkably, um, well, I'll come back to this in a minute. But um, so we would hope we would be able to develop an increase in resilience, in resilience in people and prevent depression if we could develop an understanding of this. So we took um, uh, uh, 163 people who had FNSS, and most of these people we don't have a gene on, or there's just one of them, and have a trait. And we, you know, so we only have those genes I told you. About. And then they were uh, compared to uh, 43 of their unaffected family members. And we gave them the Connor Davidson resilience scale, and we gave them the um, we gave them the um, the uh, a, a couple of depression scales. And it's clear they had lower rate, lower depression at this time, which is just a cross-sectional assessment because depression can come and go. It's not a trait of a person. And we just, it depends on when we caught this cohort, what we would find, unlike Maurice who could have done an epidemiologic assessment of it. So they had lower depression at this time, less sleepiness, and they showed greater resilience statistically significantly on this, all of these differences were statistically significant on this rating scale. Um, so uh, I, there's a lot more we could talk about. I'm already, I think, out of time. I just want to end with a couple of comments. So there is data supporting that there is some genes that seem to make people need less sleep than everybody else. And um, it's, it's consistent with the idea that sleep need may vary among people. And I, I worry about our recommendations as a field uh, being a maladaptive for these people or, or, or disservice to them. Um, there are multiple mechanisms and multiple phenotypes, but all they have is common, common, final common pathway. The fact that some of them work on the wake side led us to hypothesize that maybe there's a thing called wake drive that is a process that's not really been considered in sleep and should be. It's like we have a two process model, circadian homostatic factors. Do we need to include like the intensity of wake? And hopefully we can get some insights about this by studying these, these animals with these mutations. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs>